Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 through 19. <clears throat> the blessing of confession. Now, I want to read through this passage, but, and I'm going to do it in a minute. So we are going to read the passage. But I'm going to ask Dennis if he'll go to the next slide. Uh, this is a quote from Corrie ten Boom. Now, Corrie ten Boom and her sister were taken captive and put in a prison of war camp during World War II, and her sister died in the camp. And Corrie survived it and became it was a, an amazing Christian anyway. She survived it because of her faith. But she traveled the world, wrote books, and spoke until she was in her 80s and just couldn't do it anymore. Uh, and this is her quote about prayer. The wonderful thing about praying is that you leave a world of not being able to do something and enter God's realm where everything is possible. Now imagine if you're in a prison camp, prison of war camp, and read that again. The wonderful thing about praying is that you leave a world of not being able to do something and you enter God's realm where everything is possible. I like the next slide. If you go ahead to the next one, Dennis. This is Martin Luther. He said this, the less I pray, the harder it gets. Do you believe that? The less I pray, the harder it gets. Let's say that together. The less I pray, the harder it gets. Yeah, that's true. The less I pray, the harder it gets. I want us to read Daniel 9, 1 through 18. <clears throat> but here's what, I'm, here's what I want you to notice as we go through and read. And I'm going to stop and make comments and then come back and tie it all together. <clears throat> In this chapter, this is Daniel's prayer. It is a prayer for the nation of Israel and Judah. Now remember, he's been a captive in Babylon since he was a teenager. And now he's probably in his 60s, 70s. He has spent his whole life in Babylon, not Israel. But here you find him praying for Israel, for Judah, for Jerusalem. This is his prayer for the nation. But there's some lessons we can also learn here, some analogies, some parallels, if you will, in Daniel's prayer for a nation that we can pull down in our prayers for our nation, which... Would you agree that our nation needs a prayer or two? Yeah, I do too. So we could pray this for our nation. This would be very appropriate. To, I, would, I wish that all of our national leaders, government leaders, would gather every morning and read this and pray over this. I think it would make a difference. So this is good for our nation, but it's also good for us individually uh, to learn some lessons about confession. Now, you know, a couple things you're going to find as we read through here. <clears throat> there are 28... 29 times where Daniel uses a personal pronoun like we, us, our. So 29 times he does that. But also 28 times he uses one of three names for God. Either Lord, all capitals, which is Jehovah or Yahweh. God, which is Elohim. Lord, capital L, small O-R-D, which is Adonai. So Jehovah is the self-existing eternal one. Elohim is the creator and Lord, small O-R-D, is Adonai, our master. So if you will permit me to do this, I'm going to read this passage, and when I get to one of their names, I'm going to use the original name. So you kind of get the feel of it. So let's start in Daniel chapter 9, verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, Ahasuerus a Mede by birth, who was made king over the Chaldean kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the books according to the word of the Lord of the prophet Jeremiah. Now stop here for a second. He had been reading Jeremiah 25 and Jeremiah 29 where God said, you're going to be in captivity for 70 years. So he read that. That the number of years for the desolation of Jerusalem would be 70. So I turn now, let, no, stay with me as I use these names. So I turn my attention to Adonai Elohim. I turn my attention to the master and the creator to seek him by prayer and petitions with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. I prayed to Jehovah or Yahweh, the self-existing eternal one, my creator, and confessed, Ah, master Adonai, 
the great and awe-inspiring creator, Elohim, who keeps his gracious covenant with those who love him and keep his commands, we have sinned. And start looking for the pronouns. We have sinned, done wrong, acted wickedly, rebelled, and turned away from your commands and ordinances. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets who spoke in your name, to our kings, our leaders, our fathers, and all the people of the land. Adonai, Master, righteousness belongs to you. But this day, public shame belongs to us, the men of Judah, the residents of Jerusalem, and all of Israel, those who are near and those who are far, and all the countries where you have banished them because of the disloyalty they have shown toward you. Jehovah, self-existent, eternal one. Public shame belongs to us, our kings, our leaders, and our fathers because we have sinned against you. Compassion and forgiveness belong to Adonai, the master, our Elohim creator. Though we have rebelled against him and have not obeyed the Jehovah, our Elohim, the self-existent one, our creator, by following his instruction that he set before us through his servants, the prophets, all Israel has broken your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. The promised curse written on the law of Moses, the servant of Elohim, has been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. He has carried out his words that he spoke against us and our rulers by bringing to, on us a disaster that is so great that nothing like what has been done in Jerusalem has ever been done under all of heaven. Just as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come on us Yet we have not sought the favor of Jehovah our Elohim by turning from our iniquities and paying attention to your truth. So Jehovah, Yahweh, self-existent, eternal one, kept the disaster in mind and brought it on us for Jehovah our Elohim, creator, is righteous in all he has done, but we have not obeyed him. But now Adonai... Master, our Elohim, creator, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a strong hand and made your name renowned. As it is this day, we have sinned, we have acted wickedly, Adonai, in keeping with all your righteous acts. May your anger and wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, for because of our sins and the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become an object of ridicule to all those around us. Therefore, Elohim, our Elohim, our Creator, hear the prayer and the petitions of your servant. Make your face shine on your desolate sanctuary for Adonai's sake. Listen closely, my Elohim, and hear. Open our, your eyes and see our desolation in the city that bears your name. Now check this out. This is, this is powerful. For we are not presenting our petitions before you based on our righteous acts but based on your abundant compassion. Adonai, hear. Master, forgive. Master, listen and act. My creator, for your own sake, do not delay, because your city and your people bear your name. Wow. It's powerful. Something interesting before we dive into this is in verse 13 it says just as it is written in the law of Moses if you have a study Bible with uh, cross references and stuff you will find this will take you back to Deuteronomy 28 and in Deuteronomy 28 God warns them that if they obey him he will bless them if they disobey him he will bring curses upon them and God does this over and over and over and over and one of the things they God warned them about in verse 49 of Deuteronomy 28, that there will come a nation and a people that will swoop down like a vulture or an eagle. Some translations use vulture, some translations use eagle. Do you know what one of the symbols of Babylon was? An eagle. God told him in Deuteronomy 28, if you don't behave me, there's going to be a nation that's going to swoop down on you like an eagle. And read Deuteronomy 28 and see. And God said, I told you that I was going to do this. If you look at all the prophets, you find, you know, from Isaiah to Malachi, the prophets are pre-exilic, exilic or post-exilic, pre-exile, exile, post-exile. So basically those three groups of prophets were saying, God's going to get you if you don't straighten out. 
or God got you because you didn't straighten out, or what have you learned from God getting you because you didn't straighten out and you don't want to do this again? Pre, exile, and post. Confession. I did not grow up in an environment where people went to confession. I think confession can be looked at as a positive or a negative thing. Look at verse 4. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed. To confess means to agree with God, to say the same thing as God, to confess. Confession is important. Proverbs 28, verse 13, the one who conceals his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them will find mercy. The great thing about God is he's not mad at you. He doesn't hate you. He that covereth his sins will not prosper, but who confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. The thing we do is this. The more we try to cover it, God uncovers it. But as soon as we uncover it, he covers it. He's not interested in embarrassing you. He's not interested in making your life harder. He's not interested in hurting your feelings or punishing you. He just wants you and I to deal with our stuff. And as soon as we deal with our stuff, he says, good, that's great. Confession deals with the elephant in the room. You know when there's something between you and somebody else? There's this elephant in the room. You know what I mean? I told this story in the first service. Tracy's working in the children's ministry in the second service. So I'm telling it again. But she heard this. She lived it. Friday. Two days ago. I was a booger. I was mean. I was grumpy. I know you can't imagine that. But I was just surly. Like Friday morning, we were, Friday's our day off. And we were going out to the kids' house and stuff and help them with the garage sale. And she, we're getting dressed, and she said, you all right? And I said, yes. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So all during the day, I was just grumpy. She tried to talk to me. She tried to be nice to me. I just didn't want any of it. I just grumpy, and I wanted to be grumpy, and I was grumpy. Has anybody else ever had one of those days besides me? Okay, and the, those that didn't, hold your hands up. Confession. That's all I'm saying. So yesterday morning, I mean, we went to bed with me surly. She's, I mean, she, you know, she's like, okay. So God wakes me up yesterday morning really early, too early, because he wanted my attention. And I'm laying there in the dark, and Tracy's just sleeping away. And God, it was like the Lord said to me, how are you going to, do a sermon on confession on Sunday if you haven't confessed on Saturday and cleared the air from Friday. Can I get a witness on that? I said, oh. So we get up, I make the coffee, we're getting ready, and before we walk out the house, I said, I gotta, I gotta say something. I'm sorry. I had a bad day yesterday. I took it out on you, and I was wrong. She says, well, that's okay. What was bugging you? And I told her, and it had nothing to, her, to do with her. It had nothing to do with you. It was just a couple of compounded weeks of irritating thing after irritating thing after irritating thing. Had a car wreck and all kinds of other stuff, and I just woke up Friday, and I was just mad. There, I said it. I hope you'll come back to church next week. I hope you haven't lost all respect for me, but I just had a bad day. And it was the elephant in the room all day Friday. You know, we spent the whole day together, but there was this thing hanging. You know, just this thing. Yesterday was so much better. You know why? I said I was sorry. I attacked the elephant in the room that I put there. It was my elephant. I brought it into the room. And I carried it around. I led that elephant around with me all day. I'm grumpy. I'm grumpy. Leave me alone. I'm grumpy. I'm not happy. And if you get in my sphere, you're not going to be happy either. So just. I tell you what, after. And she, you know what she did? She did what she does. She said, oh, sweetie, it's okay. She hugged me. She kissed me. It's okay. And she said, next time you get this way, would you please tell me? Because 
I spent the whole day wondering, what in the world is wrong with you? What did I do? What did we do? What did the world do? What did God do? What's wrong with you? Nothing. Well, you're the jerk. You would think at 65 years old I would be further along in my emotional development. <laughs> but I'm still working on me. And, you know, yesterday was so, so much better because I got rid of that, that thing. We all have things from time to time between us and God, between us and somebody. It's that elephant in the room that just stays there, and you know it's there, and you just... What, what a lot of people do when there's an elephant between them and God that needs confession, needs to deal with it, is they stop reading their Bible, they stop praying, they stop going to church because they figure if I avoid God, I don't have to think about this. And God is sitting on his throne, and he's waiting for us to get our act together and get enough common sense to, to go back to him and say, uh, you got a minute, <laughs> God, can we talk? And God says, yeah, I'm here. I'm, I'm ready to listen. I've always been here. I've always been on the throne. Here's something I'm learning. I'm going to get to this, the body of this. Here's something I'm learning. God was fine before me. And he will be fine after me. And he's fine now. So if I choose to follow him or not follow him, if I choose to obey him or not obey him, he's fine. I'm the one that's going to suffer for it. And I think a lot of Christians spend a lot of time, as Christians, unhappy because they carry unconfessed sin toward God or unresolved issues with God or with people in their lives and they just carry that thinking it'll pass, it'll get better and let me tell you, it won't until you come to the Lord and you say I need to confess this I, I need to s agree with you about this I need to say the same thing the biblical definition of confession is to agree with God or to say the same thing as God so when the Bible says something, I say, yes, I agree with that. When God says something, I say, yes, I agree with that. I agree with you, God. Sometimes people think that talking to God is like going into this conference room. And God's on one side and we're on the other side. Or maybe look at, a, look at this table as a poker table. God's there and I'm here and we're going to play this game and see who can come out on top. But here's the deal. God's got all the chips. I have no chips. I have no money in my wallet. I have no money in my account. I have nothing to bargain with. Confession is not trying to find a happy medium with God. It is agreeing with God, saying the same thing as God, saying, God, you have all the chips. You are right. I am wrong. You are truth. I am not. You are God. I'm a human. And I messed up as a Christian. And I confess. What's amazing to me about Daniel is that he confess the sins of his homeland and if you examine his life he did none of these things Nehemiah did the same thing read Nehemiah chapter 1 he had never I personally think Nehemiah had never been to Jerusalem but when he heard about Jerusalem he sat down and he wept and he fasted and he prayed broke his heart for his homeland a place he'd never seen here Daniel has not seen this place in 50 years, 60 years, and yet he is burdened for them, and you find him praying hard, not just having a prayer, you know, before the meal. Oh, Lord bless Israel. Amen. God bless, God bless Jerusalem. He can say, help them do good. No, he was broken. Listen to, uh, Deuter uh, to Daniel 9, 4, 1 through 4, and this is from a paraphrase. It's called the message. It's not translation of the Bible it's just a paraphrase but listen to how he words it I Daniel was meditating on the scriptures that gave according to the word of God and the prophet Jeremiah the number of years that Jerusalem had to lie in ruins namely 70 I turned to the master God asking for an answer praying earnestly fasting with meals wearing rough penitential burlap and kneeling in the ashes I poured out my heart bearing my soul to God my Confession. Confession. Before we talk about what true confession is and we look at it from this passage, I want to talk about false confession. Let's go to that slide, Dennis, if you would. There's a bunch of ways to that we think we confess, but we actually didn't. One is if. 
Now listen to this and see if this sounds familiar. If you've ever heard anybody say this, or if you've ever said something like this. If I've hurt anybody, I'm sorry for what you're feeling. Have you ever heard anything like that? I'm sorry for the way you feel. If I've hurt you, I'm so sorry for how you feel. It's on you. Is that confession? No. Here's another one. I'm in process. I've learned so much from this. This will make us all better in the future. I've heard that one. Is there any confession in that? No. Here's the worst one. I've heard so many athletes do this after they do something stupid like beat up a woman in an elevator or have pot in Russia or any number of stupid things. I've heard this one. We all just want to put this behind us and move forward. Have you ever heard that one? Just want to put this behind us and move forward. Now, you know my wife. What if Saturday morning I got up, we got up, and I said, we're standing in the bathroom brushing our teeth, and I said, you know, if I've hurt you in any way, I'm sorry for the way you feel. You think Sister Baker's going to... That ain't working. How about this one? What if I tra said to Tracy, you know, I learned so much from yesterday. This will make us both better. <laughs> no. How about this one? Hey, Tracy, you know what? I just want to put yesterday behind us and move forward. Does that solve anything? You could say no. No. Those are, that's false confession. What is true, honest, genuine confession, and, ha and how do we find that based on this scripture? Go to the next slide. There are two things about honest, true confession. There is honesty and there's humility. There has to be honesty in confession or it's not confession. There has to be humility in confession or it's not confession. If you're confessing your sins to God, whatever they are, there's got to be honesty. There's got to be humility. If you're trying to fix a relationship with someone else, there's got to be honesty and humility. And in Daniel's case where he's praying for his uh, origin, original homeland, he was praying, he was joining with them, praying for stuff that he had nothing to do with, with humility and with honesty. So let's walk through this. There's honesty, verses 4 through 16. Honesty about what? And you, you see this, you see 28 times God's names are used. There's honesty about who he is. There's also honesty about who they were. 29 times Daniel said, we, us, our. Go to the next slide, Dennis. To confess means to agree with God and be the same thing as God. Who he is and who I am. Now, if you'll jump to the next one. Who is he? Who is God? He is Lord. He is Lord. He is uh, Jehovah or Yahweh. If you look at Jehovah, it is a compilation of three Hebrew words, which means basically the God who was, the God who is, and the God who is to come. God is not I was, God is I am. God is not I will be, God is I am. Jesus said, I'm the great I am. I am the door, I'm the shepherd, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life, I'm the resurrection, I am. God is Jehovah. He is the self-existent, eternal one, the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, all capitals, Lord. Number two, he's God, Elohim. He is the creator. He created you and I. And then capital L, small O-R-D, he is Lord. He is Adonai. He is my master. So if you put those together and you see how many times he uses his name interchangeably, he's using Elohim, Yahweh, Jehovah, Adonai, Elohim, Adonai, Jehovah, Yahweh. He's just using them back and forth and back and forth to acknowledge who God is. Who is God? He is the self-existent one. He doesn't need anybody. He's eternal. He's always been here. He's always going to be here. He is God, the creator. He's the one that created you and made you with your DNA and your personality and your shape, your spiritual gift, your heart, your ability, your personality, your experiences. He's the creator. He is the Lord. He is the Adonai. He is the master. He is the one sitting on the throne. He is the one that is in charge. And Daniel was acknowledging our hope as a nation, my hope as a person, comes from recognizing being honest with who he is. 
God is not here, and I'm here, and somehow we want to kind of bridge the gap to make us like him or maybe make him work for us. It doesn't work that way. He is God, and we are not. He is God, and I am not. So there's honesty about who he is. In verse 4, it says he is the covenant maker, and he's the keeper of those covenants. In verse 7, he is righteous. In verse 9, he's compassionate. He's forgiving. Now, let's look at the next side. Who, who were they? Who they were? Sinners. We, us, our. They were rebels in verse 9. They were disobedient in verse 10. They were lawbreakers in verse 11. They were ignoring God's truth in verse 13. And Daniel was saying, God, we have done this, which is amazing to me that he owned this. He took something upon him that was not he was a teenager when they took him he was the best of the best of the best that's why they took him they were the best kids they could find they took them to reprogram them and he spent his entire life away from Jerusalem away from Judah away from Israel in Babylon and yet he still has this burden as an older man as, as a guy probably now in his 60s or 70s he is praying this way with sackcloth with ashes with weeping with, with burden he's praying for a land that he may not have lived to see to go home we don't know if Daniel ever got to go home Daniel been in Babylon his whole life but confession is honesty being honest about who he is, being honest about who I am. Confession is genuine. Confession is raw. Confession is unvarnished. There is no, no negotiation in confession. I know as a parent, when our son growing up, if he ever did something he shouldn't do, which, he, I mean, every kid does, what you want as a parent is to hear honesty and humility. I did this. We have a video of one of my granddaughters, and she's holding a hair thing, and she snaps it in half. And it was, belonged to her sister, and her sister said, you broke my headband. And Amelia said, no, I didn't. We got the video where she took it and went, Tah! that's not honesty or humility. Of course, she was two, so what are you going to do? But some, what we want as parents, what God wants with his children, what God wants with the nation of Israel, what God wants with our nation is honesty. Raw, unvarnished, total surrender, honest about who God is, honest about who I am. And then there's humility. Humility, look at verse 17. Therefore, whenever you see therefore anywhere in the Bible, look back to see what it's there for. It's, it's summing up something. Verse 17, therefore, our God, hear the prayer and the petitions of your servant. Make your face shine on your desolate sanctuary for the Lord's sake. Listen closely, my God, and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations in the city that bears your name. For we are not presenting our petitions before you based on our righteous acts, but based on your abundant compassion. Lord, hear. Lord, forgive. Lord, listen and act. My God, for your own sake, do not delay because your city and your people bear your name. Humility is throwing myself on the mercy of God without making any excuses at all. I did it. Or I didn't do it. In church, we call those the sins of commission and the sins of omission. That's what they're called. Sins that I, things I did I shouldn't have done or things I should have done that I didn't do. God, I did it or I didn't. I was supposed to and I didn't. Or I wasn't supposed to and I did. Being honest and then humbling myself before his feet and knowing that I am dealing with an absolutely 100% perfect holy God. That my only opportunity for mercy and grace is Christ. I can't be good enough to satisfy a holy and righteous God. It is only through the person and the work of Jesus Christ, who is my advocate, who makes it possible for me to be right with a holy, righteous God. So I throw myself at his mercy. 
1 John 1, 9 says this, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We confess our sins. We agree with God. 1 John was written to Christians, not unbelievers. And he says to Christians, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. He says in chapter 2, verse 1, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation of our sins, not for us only, but for the sins of the whole world. So when I confess my sins to God, it's not like going to a confessional booth or going to the principal's office. It's like clearing the air with my heavenly Father that loves me more than I could possibly describe, who created me in His own created me in His own image, Genesis one, who saved me by grace through faith, and I am now His workmanship, Ephesians two ten, created in Christ Jesus to do good works with God which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. God created me, saved me to serve him, to bring him glory, and to share him with other people. And when I trip along the way, when I have a bad Friday or whatever, I can go to the Lord and say, I have no excuse. I'm sorry. I went to a marriage seminar one time. They spent a whole session. Trace and I had been married less than two years. A bunch of us newlyweds, we went to this, like all of us had been married like a year to two years. We went to this marriage seminar. Five couples. Two of us, two couples were still married. The other three are divorced. We've been married 45 years. The other couple's been married 47. But we spent a whole session on this. Twelve words that will save your marriage. This is great. You're going you, you to need to write these down. Twelve words. I am sorry. I was wrong. Please forgive me. I love you. I, w- I am sorry. Let's say that one. I am sorry. Some of you have never said the word sorry. Some of you just choked on that. I am <laughs> I am sorry. I was wrong. I was wrong. Please forgive me. And I love you. What would be so bad about saying that to the Heavenly Father? I'm sorry. I was wrong. Please forgive me. I love you. And I can almost hear God say, I love you too. I always have. Even when you're a knucklehead, I still love you. Now, when I come to God in this way, with honesty and humility, like Daniel prayed, when I come to God in this way, it clears my conscience of sin and of guilt. I don't feel bad anymore. Because I'm I got it out. That elephant in the room that I knew was there and God knew was there. I got it out. It's gone. It's gone. The problem with those elephants is sometimes they come back and bite you. And you got to run them off again. Daniel prayed three times a day. The early church prayed three times a day. Maybe there's something in that. Maybe uh, Luther's words were true. The less I pray, the harder it gets. Yeah. But when I confess my sin, he's faithful and just to forgive me, and that guilt is released. It's gone. The elephant's out of the room. I feel forgiven. I feel complete. I feel whole. I feel right with God. Father, thank you for the powerful prayer that Daniel prayed for his nation, for his people, and really for himself too. He was owning the burden of his nation, of his parents, his grandparents, his great-grandparents, his great-great-grandparents, his ancestors, his heritage. He was praying for that nation that you would let them go home soon. I pray for my nation Pray the same thing, Lord. We have rebelled against you as a nation. We have sinned against you. 
you are holy and righteous and you deserve better than the way you have been treated lately by this nation. We pray that as a nation we would repent, we would confess no varnish, no smoothing it over, no making excuses, but as a nation we would fall on our face and confess our sins to you. And that for me as an individual, when I trip and stumble along the way, that I would come to you and confess to agree with you, to say the same thing as you and repent from that, which means to change my mind. And as I turn and turn back towards you and confess that sin to you and clear the air with you, there is such an enormous freedom and a, a breath of fresh air that comes through my soul when I know I've done what I need to do. I thank you that I can come to you because of what Christ has done, that we can come boldly to the throne of grace and obtain mercy to find grace in time of need. So, Father, we thank you for the gift of confession, the blessing of it. This is a good thing. Confession is a good thing. It clears the air. Thank you, Lord, that you've given us that we don't have to do some magic, some hard thing to appease your anger that your anger was appeased on the cross through Christ and we have been forgiven and made whole because of what Christ has done for us so thank you for that help us Lord to remain every single solitary day for the rest of our lives honest and open before you that there would never be a day where we keep harboring stuff that we should bring to you that every day we keep that channel of communication open with you through scripture, through prayer, through worship. And that, Lord, we stay in constant communion with our Heavenly Father. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.